I'm the chair of the Northwest branch of the Royal Society of Biology, and I'd like to introduce a good friend of ours, Dr. Mark Wooms, who uh, I've known for, for many years. Uh, got, him, got to know him first when he was running um, a marine ecology centre at Knot End here in Lancashire. I used to take my students up there and even worked part time uh, at the college teaching my students too. Um, he's had many roles in his uh, marine biology life. He uh, worked on the Sea Fisheries Committee, um, appointed by uh, government ministers. He is director and council member. Are you still director, Mark? Uh, director and council member of the Marine Conservation Society. And as a result of that, also jointly founded the local Lancashire Marine Conservation Society. His professional life now is taken up with running his own consultancy at WA Marine and Environment. And he's uh, got, therefore, lots and lots of experience of marine biology, particularly at source, in spending a lot of his time deep underwater. Um, and I think the, a lot of the images you will see will be taken, uh, will have been taken by Mark himself. So let's get started. Here is Mark Wooms to talk about echinoderms. Right, okay, well I've been asked tonight to talk to you about echinoderms, uh, the spiny skinned animals. Um, so you're probably very familiar with these groups of animals, you'll certainly know the starfish, let me just see if I can get a little pen working so that I can actually show you things. So we have five groups of echinoderms. We've got the starfish, which you can see there. We have the sea urchins, which you'll be familiar with as well. Um, down here, we have the brittle stars. Up here, we have the feather stars. And over here, we've got the sea cucumbers. So they're the five groups within the echinoderms, the spiny skinned animals. So first of all, then, what makes something an echinoderm? Um, well, generally, they have five lines of symmetry. They have pentaradiate symmetry. Um, of course, just to confuse biologists, there are starfish with seven arms. There are starfish with 10 arms, 13 arms. And I think there's even one somewhere in the world with over 40 arms. Um, generally, they have pentaradiate symmetry. If you wanted to be perfectly correct, you would say they have radial symmetry. Uh, maybe I should have pointed out that all the slides were taken in the UK. So my, my talk is very UK orientated rather than, than world orientated. Um, echinos is a Greek word meaning spiny, demata skinned, so the spiny skinned or hedgehogged animals. Um, all echinoderms live in the sea. There are no echinoderms in fresh water. There are no echinoderms on land. They're exclusively marine. And again, here we've got a bit of a generalization. They've got a mouth underneath and they've got a bottom on top. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work all the way through. There are always exceptions, as I'll point out to you later. Um, if you think of a starfish, they've got five arms, but how many legs have they got? They've got hundreds and hundreds of little legs called tube feet. So many of these move on their tube feet. And this is all to do with a water vascular system running through starfish, sea urchins, all the echinoderms. It's a system of canals uh, which can increase and decrease water pressure. So it's a hydrostatic water vascular system that I'll mention a little bit about later on. OK, then we said within the echinoderms, there are five groups or five classes. Um, when above the most primitive group are the crinoids or the lily-like animals um, in, in, in the UK, the feather stars. Um, there are about 600 species worldwide, but here in the UK, we only have three. So what makes something a crinoid or a feather star? Um, well, you can see one a picture there on the left. Um, it's not a flower as it looks like, it is very definitely an animal. So they have five arms again. I know if you count them, it looks like it's got 10, but each of the five arms are subdivided into two at the base. And so you can see the top half is a crown and the crown has these, um, these little pinules on it and the tube feet are on the actual pinules. So there's your pinule and the tube feet are on there. Then here at the base, we have a stalk and all the UK species have lots of little legs or Siri, these bits running down here. 
Um, after having told you that all the echinoderms have a mouth underneath and a bottom on top, the crinoids, of course, don't. The mouth and anus on those is both on the top or upper side. And we said here that they're attached to the base by a stalk, or in the case of the UK ones, all these little legs, the Siri. So let's have a look at the UK species. Um, I'm afraid not everything has common names, uh, although people are trying to create common names at the moment. This one here is a very shallow water species called the rosy feather star, Antidon bifida. Uh, and it's very easy to identify because it's untidy. In fact, the, the sort of the, the scruffy feather star for me would be a much better name. If you look at the arms, they're all quite untidy, quite scruffy, quite tatty when you compare them with the other species. But if you really want to be absolutely certain that you've got the right species, you count its little legs or Siri. So here you've got the Siri holding it onto the hard substrate and they generally have about 25. So if you can count something like 12 going around here, then obviously there's the ones on the other side. So it's got about 25 little legs. So it must be Antidon bifida. Um, closely related, but bigger, lives in deeper water, neater. You've got Antidon potassus. As far as I know, it has no common name. Um, you can't go on colour. Colours are a very dangerous thing because they come in all sorts of different colours. So if we look here, there you can see we've got a bright red one, we've got a bright yellow one. And maybe if I just go back to this one here, the surefire way again is to count its little legs or Siri. And if you look down there, there must be at least 25 there because these have usually about 50 little legs and on occasions can have up to 100. So that's the surefire way of identifying that one. Then we've got the final species of feather star, my favourite. This is the northern feather star or Celtic feather star, Leptometra celtica. Uh, that's a really, really smart one. It's a deep water species. Most of them occur about a thousand metres in depth. Um, never really occur shallower than 40 metres. Um, and yet I can show you hundreds of these in just 13 metres. Where I live is Loch Sunart on the Arden American Peninsula and that is a marine protected area. And one of the main reasons it's protected is because the Northern Feather Star occurs there and the Northern Feather Star occurs in very, very shallow water in big numbers. Um, so this is a Scottish marine priority feature, this particular Feather Star. And this time, look at its legs, just look how long they are. They're about four times the length of the other Feather Stars. So the really easy way to actually identify them. Again here, look at the length of the legs. These are the northern feather stars in shallow water in Loch Sunar in Scotland. Now this picture is quite unique, I think, because it actually contains all three species, all three species occurring at the same depth, which for a shallow water species, uh, an incredibly deep water species is quite unusual. So this big main one here, look, there's the long legs, the Siri. So this is the northern or Celtic feather star. Look at these tatty, scruffy little ones here, over here. So that's Antidon bifida, the rosy feather star. And then look at this little red one here. Count the number of legs, and there's going to be about 50 or more. Um, so that one must be Antidon potassus, which has no common name. So that's really quite unusual, I think, to see all three species um, occurring at the same depth. Right, so that'll do for the crinoids. Let's move on to the Asteroidea, um, the true starfish. So what makes something an Asteroidean? Uh, well, they've got spiny skin here, as you can see on this one. They've got the five arms, the pentaradiate symmetry. They've got lots of little legs you can see there. So let's have a look at the key species. Five or more arms. So nearly always have five arms, but of course in the UK we have a seven arm starfish and we have two species of sun starfish, which have anything from seven to 14 arms. Um, most are predatory. So earlier on, we saw the feather stars, they just filter their food out the water by waving their arms around. These actually go out and actively seek their food, their predators. Um, they've got superb regeneration capabilities. Chop an arm off, it'll grow a new one back. Chop two arms off, it'll grow two back. Chop them all off, it'll grow them all back. So really, really good at regenerating. Um, here we've got the common starfish, Asterius rubens. If you stroke it, very, very spiny, spiny skinned animal. Um, it's got five arms. See that little bit there? That's called a madreporite or sieve plate. And that's the bit that draws in water. Because remember, they have a hydrostatic or skeleton 
and a water vascular system. So they draw in water through there. There is a ring canal around there. And then there is a radial canal that goes down through each of the arms. And then this radial canal has lateral canals which go to these little tube feet, these bits down here. So by increasing and decreasing the pressure, it can move these little tube feet around and actually move. Uh, not only can it move, it can actually find its food, it can open up its food. Um, they're also sensory, so lots of wonderful little things. Let's have a close-up look at the arm of the common starfish, Styrius rubens. So here you can see the tube feet, these little legs that are controlled by water pressure. Now these ones at the end here, these are all sensory, so they can actually smell or detect their food as well. And then believe it or not, that little bit there is its eye. They've actually got five eyes. They've got an eye um, at the tip of each one of their arms. Again, here we've got a common starfish feeding. Um, and you can see underneath that one, there's a rather large shore crab. Uh, normally, a starfish would, I think, struggle to battle with something as big as that. I would suspect that if you were able to touch that crab, you'd find that it was soft bodied. In other words, I think it's just molted and is in a bit of a weakened state. I think a fully healthy shore crab that size would actually struggle um, uh, to, to, to get, um, uh, would actually struggle to eat a crab that size. Their normal favourite food are, are mussels. So here we've got some Morecambe Bay mussels, and this is the favourite food of the starfish. Now, mussels are incredibly strong. I, I would imagine there's nobody here in the audience who could open up a mussel with their bare hands. But a small starfish, maybe just 10, 15 centimetres across, could actually quite easily open up one of these mussels. So what they do, they crawl along on their five arms on their tube feet till they find a mussel. Uh, and a mussel, of course, has two shells. They wrap their five arms around the two shells. They attach each one of those little legs, those tube feet, to the two valves, to the two shells, and then they pull. The idea is they're trying to pull the mussel open. But mussels are far too strong, so the starfish perseveres. It pulls and it pulls and it pulls, and it could pull for 24 hours, maybe even 48 hours, before it just pulls the mussel open about a millimetre it then does a fairly revolting thing. Remember, on the starfish, the mouth is on the underside. So what they do is they turn their stomachs inside out, they drop the stomach out through the mouth and they drop it into the mussel shell. They then release all the digestive enzymes, turn all the mussel flesh to a liquidy goo, and then they suck it all back in and off they go looking for something else to feed on. Uh, right, here we've got a big gathering of starfish. Um, and you're all muted, aren't you? I was going to ask you the question, what's the name for a big gathering of starfish? What, what would you call a gathering of starfish? Well, it's actually a constellation or a galaxy, a galaxy or a constellation of starfish, which you've got there. Now, why have they all gathered together? Um, my best guess is if you look down here amongst them, can you see all these little tower shells? There are loads and loads and loads of tower shells, and most of them look to be dead. Actually, that one doesn't. That one looks like it's got a little hermit crab in. But I would think they've gathered en masse to actually feed on these tower or turret shells. And then we've got another example here. Of we've got another little small galaxy of starfish. And there we have a battle of inside out stomachs. Um, in the middle of them is something called a, a horse mussel. Or in Scotland, we call them clabby doos. I imagine a large Morecambe Bay mussel, maybe about four times as big. So one of them has taken many, many hours uh, slowly but surely pulling it open, inserting its stomach in there, and of course it's released a smell into the water. The, the sensory um, tube feet uh, have detected this smell, other starfish have come in, and now what you've got there is you've got a battle of half a dozen inside out stomachs, all sort of working away on the muscle flesh. And here we have yet another gathering. Um, this was a dive in Loch Nevis that I did a few years ago, and there were hundreds and hundreds of starfish around. I was trying to work out what was going on. And then, I don't know if you can see, they're releasing some sort of fluid into the water. And um, that is actually eggs and sperm. They're separate sexes, so some are releasing eggs, some are releasing sperm, and it was a synchronized spawning, probably brought on by a slight increase in the temperature of the water. They all get together and they all release the egg and the sperm, uh, at the same time. Um, just slightly spoilt by the toilet paper that was all around uh, that had been released from the yachts from their toilets above me. Uh, let's, leave the, um, let's leave the common starfish and have a look at a few of our more exotic species in the UK. 
probably the most colourful, or one of the most colourful, has got to be the Bloody Henry. Uh, the Bloody Henry, uh, there are two species and you can't tell the difference, not in the field. You've really got to get them in the laboratory to tell the difference. But they come in all different sorts of wonderful colours. Um, so it's gone again. So here we have a rather nice mauvey coloured Bloody Henry. Um, it's thought that these are one of the few starfish that actually brood their young. Norm normally your males and your females, as we saw earlier, just release the egg and sperm into the water and it's a random hit and miss affair um, over what happens. It's actually thought that these maybe brood the eggs uh, underneath the five arms and wait till they actually hatch. You can see the same features as we saw on the common starfish. It's got five arms. It's slightly rough. It's a bit it's velvety, I think, rather than spiny. There's the little madreporite that actually draws the water in. And um, you can just see a little tube feet at the end. And again, at the tips, they have little eyes. Um, here we've got yet a different colour one. You can clearly see the eye on that one. And you can clearly see the tube feet at the end. They're quite benign, delicate starfish. And their favourite food tends to be sponge. Um, here's yet another different colour. Oh, and there, there's a sort of mottled colour. So all different colours. You actually get these in Morecambe Bay as well, but not in the same colour varieties that I find up in Scotland. Now, this particular starfish, I was beginning to believe didn't exist. It's the goosefoot starfish, Anseropoda placenta. And after 30 years of diving, I'd never seen one. I'd never come across it at all. And that, that's quite difficult when these things are big. They're nearly as big as a dinner plate. So I was wondering what was going on. And then about seven or eight years ago, I came across this one. And you can see it's completely covered in sediment. Um, so I brushed the sediment off and there underneath was the goosefoot starfish. And the reason I wasn't seeing them was because they bury. And um, now that I've got my eye in, I can probably spot one or two on every single dive that I do in Loch Sunart. So I now see them all the time after having seen none for over 30 years. Well, one of the most amazing things about these is that they feed on small crustaceans. They feed on small shrimps and prawns, supposedly. But nobody, absolutely nobody, knows how they can possibly catch them. Uh, and I don't have any theories on that one at all. So if anybody has any ideas. Um, here's a cushion star, again, very brightly coloured, uh, Perania pulvillus. Um, I don't know how, this is a spiny skinned animal, if you touch them they're actually quite greasy and slimy. And also on the top, see all these little white bits, these little papillae, and these little papillae enable it to respire, that's how it actually breathes. But again, you can see the tube feet there, uh, it's got an eye there at the end of the arms, and I've given this talk just once before, and, and I said that I found somewhere that these were thought to eat um, on dead men's fingers. I said, but in all my diving, I'd never seen one anywhere near a dead man's finger. So I didn't actually know whether this was the truth or what. And then I probably got an email with a picture of one of these actually grazing on dead men's fingers. So they do feed on dead men's fingers. This is our largest starfish in Britain. This is the spiny starfish. And you can see a little squat lobster there to give you some idea of its size. Um, these can get up to well over half a metre and they really, really live up to their name. They are unbelievably spiny, really, really very, very spiny. These will pull open bivalves like mussels to feed on them, um, but have a close look and they've got a really quite interesting structure. So here we can see the spines. There's a spine. There's a spine. In the middle here, these are all the papillae, which are used for respiration. But the best thing about it is you can see the pedicellarii, these little sets of jaws. So there's one, there's one, there's another one. These are little jaws that actually stop things from settling on it. If you think all these starfish, they're always clean. How do they maintain the, the cleanliness? Well, these little jaws will actually remove anything that settles on it. They can be used in defense. And there's one species, not in the UK, that is actually able to catch fish with these jaws, actually catch fish, and then it's able to feed on them. And if you look at these little pom-poms that surround the spines, these are also made up of little tiny, small pedicellaria, little small, tiny jaws, which you can just about spot on them. Um, this is a starfish that lives on sand. Um, this one's very common in Morecambe Bay as well. Um, so the sand star, Astropectin irregularis, you don't normally see it like that. It's normally buried. And this aboral disc 
this bit here is the only bit that sticks through the sediment and that's the bit that it actually respires through that enables it to breathe. Um, its tube feet don't have those little suckers on the end, they actually end in points. Now maybe I should point out at this point that um, having called those little tube feet with suckers on the end and for many years I believed that they were suckers and that's how they stuck to things like the mussel shell, um, it's not true. Uh, it's actually a glue, it's an adhesive. There's an adhesive on the bottom of the suckers and that's how it fastens. It's not a suction at all. Now then, let's have a look at some of the starfish that confuse biologists because they don't have the, uh, the five lines of symmetry. Uh, we've got the sun star here and it has a variable number of arms. They can have anything from eight to 14. Um, this particular one has 10, I think, which is the most common number. These are quite big, about dinner plate size, and they're, they're voracious predators of other starfish, sea urchins. Um, I was reading a, a paper the other day, a scientific paper, which actually claimed that this was the slowest moving starfish in Britain at 0.3 millimetres a minute. Um, I don't believe it. I've had loads of these as pets. And when they want to, they, they can move. So I, I, I'm afraid I don't believe that bit of research of these being the slowest ones that there are. Um, these actually love to eat other starfish. So as you've got your starfish pulling open your muscle, it's quite possible to see one of these on top of the starfish devouring the starfish's arm as it pulls open the muscle. Um, I should maybe point it out that starfish don't actually need to eat. You can starve them for months on end. If you starve them, they just shrink. They just get smaller and smaller and smaller until you start feeding them again. And then they start to grow bigger and bigger and bigger again. Um, this is another sun star. These normally have seven to 13 arms most commonly nine or 10. Um, again, this is about dinner plate size. It's another vicious predator of other starfish and sea urchins. Uh, all the key features of your echinoderm, apart from that it's got double the number of arms. And here we've got the seven arm starfish. Now we, we mentioned possibly that the sun star was supposed to be the slowest moving starfish in Britain. This without a shadow of a doubt is the fastest starfish in the UK. And I would say it's the fastest starfish in the world. Um, these can actually do 50 millimeters. Um, no, sorry, I think, sorry, not 50 millimeters, I think it's 50 centimeters a minute. So these things really can move. Look at the length of the tube feet, look at the length of these legs, and they can run on these. Um, their favorite food are brittle stars, and here you can see black brittle stars surrounding this seven-armed starfish, and this is running after them, and these are all trying to run away. Um, they're vaguely bioluminescent, which is actually telling it that we're going to release a toxin and you're not going to like it when we release this toxin. But the starfish doesn't care. It still eats them, still catches them. So this is one of its favourite foods. So let's move on to the next class of uh, the brittle stars within the echinoderms. So these are the Ophiroidea, um, sea serpents or brittle stars. So what are the key features that make something a brittle star? Well, they've got very, very slender, delicate arms. Brittle stars, quite an appropriate name for them. You just look at them and the arms drop off. They really are very, very delicate. Um, and although they do have tube feet on their arms, they don't use them for locomotion. So whereas a starfish can go in any direction, just follow an arm, these can't. And, and it's quite difficult to demonstrate how these move without you being able to see me, but they sort of move on two arms. Two arms go forward and then they pull themselves forward on them. It's a little bit like the way some of the things in War of the Worlds move. move. Um, so very slender arms showing any transverse movement. Um, normal starfish have organs in their arms. They have digestive organs, reproductive organs in their arms. Um, brittle stars have no organs whatsoever in their arms. Uh, so here we've got the most common one in Britain, the common brittle star, Ophiothrix fragilis, and these are suspension feeders. So you can see they're waving their arms around trying to catch food uh, in the water column. So they're after, they're after usually little bits of detritus, maybe the odd little bit of plankton. Uh, and these occur in vast numbers. There can be 2,000 per square metre, so big numbers. And here, if we go close up, we're now looking closely up at the arms, the little banded arms of the common brittle star, Ophiothrix fragilis. And often this is associated with the black brittle star. So here we've got Ophiocamina nigra, the black brittle star. But you can see how they tend to stay together with their own species rather than mix. So the bees of the black brittle stars, big numbers, maybe not quite as big numbers as the common brittle star. 
And if we have a close up look again, there you can see there's the central disc. These are the arms with which they show just their transverse movement with no organs in them whatsoever. Um, the little tube feet are actually here. And when they catch food in their arms, the food is transported by the tube feet down to the mouth, which is underneath. And um, having said again, mouth underneath and a bottom on top, these don't even have a bottom. The, the mouth and the anus is one and the same on the underside. Um, then we've got the, the brittle stars that we call the serpent stars. Uh, there are two species that look very, very similar. So there's this one, Ophiura Ophiura, and there's this one here, Ophiura albida. The way I tell the difference is this one here has 10 little white bits, 10 little white scales there just at the base of the arm. And if you go back to the other one, you'll see there's nothing on this one at all. The other way to, to, to find out what species they are is to scare them. If you scare this one, it runs away. If you scare this one, it burrows. So completely different behavior once you scare them. And then we've got true burrowing starfish or true burrowing brittle stars. Um, we've got two species of Amphiura. And this one here um, is actually waving its arms around, trying to catch little bits of detritus, maybe bits of plankton. The body is buried underneath. Um, the other species of Amphiura is more likely to have its arms laying flat on the sand as it's a true detritivore as opposed to a suspension feeder. So let's move on to the next class. The next class now we've got are the sea urchins, so class Echinoidea. And here we've got the, the shore urchin. And what are the key features? Well, again, believe it or not, it has five lines of symmetry, but they're easier to see if you cut one open. Um, it's got the tube feet, it's got these spines, it's got a mouth underneath and it's got a bottom on top. So, so they've got a rigid calcareous test. So they're made up of calcareous plates and these calcareous plates are quite tightly packed together and then they're covered in articulating spines, which you can see there. They have no actual arms, although, as I say, the five lines of symmetry are quite visible. Cut one open and first of all, you'd see is five identical gonads. Um, so let's have a look at the UK species. This is the edible sea urchin, occurs in big numbers all the way around the UK. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever eaten a sea urchin, but the reason these are called edible sea urchins is that people eat their gonads. And the Scottish sea urchin, and these are from Loch Sunar. The Scottish sea urchin has the best tasting gonads in the whole world, or so I'm told. Um, the only other sea urchin with gonads that taste as good or nearly as good is the Chilean sea urchin. But there's a much better market for the Chilean sea urchin because its gonads are a nice colour. They're a nice orangey yellow colour. Whereas our Scottish sea urchin has a dirty yellow coloured gonad. And because of that, it really doesn't have the same appeal because it doesn't look as good. And there's been a lot of research over the years to try and change the colour of the Scottish sea urchin's gonad to make a fishery for it. Uh, I think the best thing anybody's come up with up to now is to actually feed them on salmon pellets. And salmon pellets gives them good growth rate and also sort of makes their, their gonad a slightly more appealing colour. Um, but thank goodness it's not going to take off. There isn't going to be a viable market for these because it wouldn't half make a mess of uh, shallow inshore communities uh, if we got rid of the sea urchins. So here again is an edible sea urchin, Echinus esculentus. You can clearly see all the tube feet and it uses these tube feet for locomotion to move around. Um, they often collect little hats. They collect little bits of shell, little bits of seaweed, uh, little bits of gravel and they plant them on top of the heads. I, I'm really not actually sure why, whether it's a sort of camouflage, if it is, it's not a very good camouflage, but it's a very common thing that sea urchins tend to do. Um, they've got all the spines again, you can see. Um, what are the spines for? Well, it's for protection, uh, protection from predators, but also protection from heavy sea states. You know, if they're, if they're knocked off the rock and they bowl around and it's knocked into another rock, it actually helps cushion the blow so you don't smash the shell or the test. And again, here we can clearly see another one. These, get up, these can get to a fair size, about 18 centimetres, about, um, that's over six inches, isn't it? So you can get fairly, fairly big ones of these. And um, they normally live for about eight to 10 years, but one has been known to live for 16 years. And you can, again, you can see the spines, you can see the tube feet, and just here, can you see the little pedicillary, these little jaws um, with which they keep themselves clean? 
So let's go close in. We're going close in onto the, uh, the edible urchin. Here you can see the spines, which are like a ball and socket joint at the bottom, a bit like your shoulder. Um, so they can move around in any direction. Here you can clearly see the pedicellarii, that one there open, these ones closed, the three sets of jaws. So they'll pick off things that are trying to settle or actually grow on them. They can be used as, uh, for defensive purposes. There's one species, although not in the UK, which can actually fire all these pedicellaria off its back and actually have a cloud of poisonous, toxic jaws, um, which will attack the thing that's trying to eat the sea urchin. Let's turn a sea urchin upside down. And if we turn it upside down here, you can see its mouth. So you've got the spines out here. You can see the tube feet. And then can you see a little ring of small pedicellarii, these small little claws. But then in the middle of the mouth here, you've got five large teeth. These teeth are actually really quite big. So there's one, there's another. There's another, there's another, there's another. So it's got five teeth and it's known as the Aristotle's lantern. And these five teeth are able to actually graze on the seaweed and also to graze on animals that are growing epiphytically on the seaweed. So they really can have quite a profound impact on ecosystems, the way they can graze all the algae down. Um, here's another species of sea urchin. This is Samachinus miliaris, the shore urchin. You can actually get this one on the shore, round here as well. Uh, lovely little purple tips on its spines. Uh, and these can reach huge numbers. These can reach numbers, these can reach numbers of up to about 350 per meter squared. So very big numbers. And again, they can have tremendous impacts on an ecosystem and on the benthic communities that occur there because they can just graze away all the algae. And you can see here, these ones are actually grazing on kelp, the big giant seaweed. So big impact. And if you remove these from, from, from the ecosystem, you get tremendous changes that take place and that, that's happening in the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean they eat these, um, it, it just hardly seems worth it. These are small, these are only about the size of a 10p piece. So the gonads are removed from them and eaten. Let's go close up and if we go close up here you can see the spines, there we can see the ball and socket joint of the spine um, and we can see the pedicellaria here uh, which again, remove debris and help in defense. Here we've got the Northern Sea Urchin. This has got quite a good scientific name, if scientific names scare you, Strongylocentrotus drobachiensis. I haven't seen one of these in the UK for years. I think as the waters are warming slowly, these things are retreating further northwards. And I actually took this picture in Norway because I can't remember the last time I saw one of these in the UK. I'm sure there must still be some around, um, but it's getting a bit too warm for them. So they're retreating rapidly northwards. And they're actually a problem in Norway for exactly the same reasons the previous two I've mentioned. Um, they have phenomenal impacts on grazing the algae and they can just wipe out an ecosystem very, very quickly. Um, here's a more local urchin. This is the heart urchin. And you can see it's an irregular shaped urchin. Have a look at the spines and can you see how they're all angled backwards? It's sort of slip streams. So those are the spines. And that's because you don't normally see these on the surface. These are normally buried down in eight to 16 centimeters of sand or mud. Uh, and the only connection with the surface um, is, is a breathing tube put to respire and an excretory tube. So you can actually spot these in Morecambe Bay if you go out looking for, for, for the grooves that the tubes actually provide. So the heart urchin, echinocardium cordatum. You're most likely to see these on the seashore. You'll see the empty dead shells or tests and they're known as sea potatoes uh, very often locally within the area. Right, okay, let's move on to the last of the five classes, um, the holothuroidea. Uh, of obscure origin means I think nobody really knows what it means. So this is the sea cucumbers. So we're now having a look at the sea cucumbers. And what are the features that makes something a sea cucumber? Well, if you look at the picture on the right there, you can't see most of this sea cucumber. Its body is buried. So it has a long sausage-like uh, body that is completely buried here 
and then only a small part of it comes to the surface and then it generally has ten tentacles which it waves around trying to catch food. So an elongate sausage shaped body with no arms. Um, it has branch tentacles, generally about 10, around the mouth. So let's have a look at a few. This is my favourite one by a long, long way. I, as far as I know, it has no common name. It has a lovely scientific name, Solus Fantopus. And its body is buried underneath the gravel. You can just see a small part of it sticking up. And then you've got the 10 tentacles, which are actually catching food in the water column. And have a look at this one here. Can you see that arm bent over into its mouth? So what it's done, it's actually catching all the food. It's a suspension feeder. It's catching all the food in the water column. And when it's caught enough food on its tentacle, then the tentacle goes into its mouth. It's sucked clean and then it's pulled out. And then the next one goes in and so on and so on. Now, the weird thing about Solus Fantopus is that I can go for a dive and I can see loads of them, hundreds and hundreds of them. And I can go in again and there's none. They've all gone. And this has gone on for years. And finally, I thought I'd check my records. And in Loch Suna, I only ever see them in May. So only in May, they disappear for the other 11 months of the year. I can only assume that they actually disappear underneath the gravel and just all emerge in May. And yet in other locks, in Loch Craran, I found that all the photographs I got of Loch Craran of them, I'd taken them in April. So they only appeared in Loch Craran in April. And I thought I'd begun to get this sus that they just appear for about four to six weeks of the year, just slightly different times in different sea locks. And then one turned up in January, which completely blew my theory. So again, I can't fully explain that one. They just seem to disappear and then suddenly emerge on mass. Now, these aren't really very exciting, but uh, this, they, they do live in all different sorts of substrates. So this particular one, Thinidium drummondi, um, this one tends to live in more like muddy, muddy gravelly sediments here. So again, there's a big sausage shaped body buried under here. Um, here we've got the tentacles waving around trying to catch food. And then here we have another species, Aslia lefevre, and this one lives in rock crevices. And this one I find quite amazing because it's able to liquefy its body and pour itself. It actually pours itself um, into the rock crevices. Um, so how does it actually do that? Well, it's able to actually, it's, it's made up of catch collagen and it's able to undo these sort of collagen plates and actually liquefy its body, pour itself into the crevice. And then once it's in there, it rejoins them all up together again. So re really quite a specialized adaption. Now, this is probably what you more imagine a sea cucumber to look like, but we don't have many species in the UK that look like this one. This is called the cotton spinner, Holothoria forscali. So here's the long cucumber shaped body. And the bit you were looking at on the other ones that was sticking out is that bit there. So those are the feeding tentacles just there. Now, this has the ability to shoot things called cuvarian tentacles or, or cuvarian threads um, at things that are trying to attack it. So if something comes along and decides it wants to eat this cotton spinner, um, from somewhere here close to the cloaca and anus around about here, hundreds and hundreds of white cotton threads, these cuvarian threads, are shot out. They're really, really strong, really, really sticky. And they can do things like that. They can bind up crabs that are trying to actually eat it and attack it. Uh, and they have an 85 to 100% success rate in immobilizing crabs, but they're not so good with fish. I think they only have something like a three, 4% success rate with fish. But not only do they shoot out these threads, um, they also release holothurin, which is a toxin, and that can actually kill animals that are around in the vicinity. Now you may have come across these or thinking of sea cucumbers being able to shoot their intestines out and sure enough some sea cucumbers around the world are actually able to eject um, intestines, um, gills, reproductive systems as well uh, to deter predators and they, this will then regenerate anything from a week to about 190 days depending on what's ejected and which particular species. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we have a bit of a problem um, with sea, sea cucumbers. Um, there's a rather a large fishery for them. Uh, they're, they're known, well, they've got many names, but they're known as tripang. That's one of, one of the names. And usually they're collected by divers. 
they really came into provenance, I think, in about the 1980s. And suddenly everybody went mad for, for, for these sea cucumbers. And so there's some very dodgy practices and industries going on around the world, all completely sustainable. And now many, many species of um, sea cucumbers are verging on extinction. Um, also, so many of the divers, because the dodgy practices uh, are diving practices as well as taking the sea cucumbers. Uh, the, the main market for these is in Asia. There's a big market in China. Um, in, in China, I, th I think in, uh, in sort of folklore, these are supposed to be aphrodisiacs, especially for males. And that's because uh, one, it resembles a phallus. Uh, and two, uh, when it shoots out these cuvarian threads, its intestines, it's supposed to resemble an ejaculation. Uh, so hence, there's a big market for these. Um, they, they're either eaten, uh, oh, in Japan, they're eaten uncooked, they're eaten raw. Um, in, in countries like China, I think they tend to be, to be dried. Um, but as I say, I think there's at least 20 of the sea cucumber species which are now on the endangered list. Uh, and all that happens is when, when one species is fished out, they just move on to another one. They used to be collected on the shore, not anymore, because there aren't any left to get on the shore. You can only get them by diving, and obviously you've got to go deeper and deeper the more you remove them. As far as I'm aware, there isn't a sustainable fishery in the world. Um, luckily, it doesn't happen in the UK, um, and this particular species, Holothura fulscali, I've only mentioned it on this, is because many of the species around the world belong to the same genus, Holothuria, that are actually fished for. Um, and then the, the last one here, I've got a sea cucumber. This one here is Libidoplax digitata. As far as I'm aware, has no common name. It's a very, very small worm-like uh, sea cucumber, has 12 arms, and each one is tipped in four little tentacles. It's a detritivore, and it occurs in shallow water of the sea locks in Scotland, but actually quite hard to spot. 